Well, we are uh, convening this meeting of the Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Is the and it is. Okay, and the cool. date is uh, September 9th, 2019. And if there's anything else I'm supposed to say at the beginning, I'm sure one of my fellow committee members will. Just think we're audio and video recording. That's right. You kind of said that. Yeah. Oh, where, yes, and this meeting is being recorded. And I'm going to put my glasses on so that I can see the agenda. Looks like we don't have anybody from the public here, so we'll, uh, we don't have public comment. Uh, we now need to consider approving the minutes from the last meeting, which have been circulated. Does anyone have comments on the minutes? I will move that we approve the minutes of the last meeting. Second. Anyone have comments or discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the minutes have been approved. <clears throat> uh, we have the um, Planning and Sustainability Department coming at 11, so we'll move on to some of our other agenda items, which are uh, reporting back from any research and findings since the last meeting and um, our upcoming October public forums. We have a lot of things to decide about that. Does um, anyone wish to report on anything since the last meeting? I can report on what I've done. Is that what you mean? Or? That'd be great. Thank you. That sounds about right. My son got married on Saturday. Oh, so okay. congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. I was even crying riding my bike this morning. It was uh, so emotional. Uh, oh. Thanks for hearing that. <laughs> It'll get better. Me and eat, right. <laughs> and there were no pesticides in this. None. Excellent. I made sure of that. <laughs> and he knows your name is Kathleen. Yes, right? he does. <laughs> he called me mom. <laughs> All right. I'm just pulling up my notes. <laughs> so I was tasked with um, finding resources. Um, for training and possible grant monies and things like that for the city as one of my tasks. And um, I, I actually, I should have sent this ahead of time and I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't think of it until just now. Um, sorry, I'm trying to open it. Okay, so there are actually a number of kind of interesting resources that um, that do subsidized or um, completely free trainings for municipalities to um, convert, not necessarily entirely, but you know, particular areas to um, organically managed areas. Um, and so I have a list of one, two, three, four, five organizations that help with that. Um, I will send it around, but if you know, we decide as a as a group that that's something that we want to recommend um, to the city. We can also supply these resources. So these are organizations that essentially are working on pesticide reduction. What I haven't done yet, which I still plan to do, is to look into private foundations that actually um, may be willing to fund um, in an ongoing way the ways in which uh, cities manage their green spaces organically. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my second step. But just coming up with these five organizations um, was pretty, I thought was, was really surprising. Beyond Pesticides is working with Chip Osborne, who is the person from Marblehead, who essentially got Marblehead in 1991, so years ago, to go completely organic mm -hmm. municipally. Um, and he now has this business um, and works with a lot of nonprofits to kind of provide um, guidance to municipalities in how to do it. So Beyond Pesticides will um, fully fund a municipality to do two pilot sites of organic management of green spaces mm -hmm. and then 
um, up to three years, I think, will remain in touch with the municipality to continue to give um, guidance about how to continue that process. Um, Excuse me, I'm sorry, what did you say his name was? Chip Osborne. Osborne. With an E at the end of Osborne. <clears throat> Um, he's very well known kind of in the, in the organic management municipality kind of world in the Northeast and does trainings for this other organization, TURI, which I forget what it stands for. Do you know? Toxic use reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they actually are a granting organization and um, we, Northampton has actually worked with them via the, the municipality, the, the city of Springfield that received a huge grant from them about five years ago and Springfield actually wrote Northampton into their grant to Tory and we had two people from the DPW trained back then um, before we launched the organic management of Florence Fields. So Tory is known to Northampton and we're known to them, but um, there may be some opportunities there. <coughs> Stonyfield Organic, you know, the yogurt company in Vermont, actually has an ongoing program to train municipalities um, throughout the United States to um, convert green areas to organic. Um, they do a once a year application process for municipalities and um, it just ended and I, I just missed the boat with it. But they did say on their website, um, you know, if you're interested, we'd love to hear why and we may be adding people throughout the year. And so I, just for the heck of it, I put, you know, sent our, what our process, I told them about our, our pesticide <laughs> reduction select committee and, um, and all that. So I don't know if that will amount to anything, but um, they also do it free of charge to the municipalities because it's a, a kind of um, goal of theirs. Um, and then there are two other organizations that supply kind of tools. They, it's not and free, but they're not, they're, they don't work as closely as those other three. Did I say three organizations over? Anyway, but I will send this out and we just, it's just good to know that these resources exist and that there's this real movement, especially in the Northeast, to um, help municipalities to um, figure out non-toxic ways to manage green spaces. So. That's the beginnings of what I have done. It's very helpful. Thank you. That's great. It's very exciting. So you're going to send that uh, out. Will you also um, be sending an attachment for the minutes? Oh, I can do that, yep. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks. Oh, can I have one more really quick thing? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if people, I invited everybody before I think even our first meeting to um, be contributors and to be able to access the wakelets that I've created. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if people have had a chance, but I added recently a bunch of new stuff. Um, and some of it is are things that I sent to Adele because you two, I think, are kind of looking at what other mm -hmm. municipalities are doing. But I put um, a map, you know, there are it's amazing the resources once you start really investigating, but I put up a map that, um, that notes every city, every municipality in the United States that um, has done something towards uh, less toxic management of their spaces. And so there are just all these incredible resources there. Um, but I don't, I don't want to encroach upon what you guys are going to share, but, but um, I'm putting things up on Wakelet all the time, so you know, keep checking in about it. And perhaps uh, we can start adding the municipal policies mm -hmm. to the Wakelet. Um, is it, has anybody been on the uh, on the Wakelets? Yes. Okay. When was first put up? I yeah. Signed read everything. everything. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So we've all at least looked at it. Um, and, uh, and we know that there are going to be a lot of uh, resources added to it. It's very handy, thank you. <clears throat> um, it's sort of related to, to this, um, but it's, in a way it's new business, and so I, I don't know whether I should bring it up now or wait. Um, but. <clears throat> But here I go anyway. Mm -hmm. 
um, talking about um, joint resources is, is how it fits in. Uh, I'm thinking ahead to when we're drafting a report and, um, and the open meeting law. And we want, so we want to be drafting the report in a way that is consistent with open meeting law. On the other hand, we do want to be communicating with one another about this draft report. And um, according to open meeting law, we can't do that except in an in a open meeting. So I thought I would check in with uh, the solicitor, uh, Alan Seewald, to see whether if we posted publicly um, a Google Doc that anyone could view, and that all of us have editing privileges of, we could perhaps be working on a document in between meetings. Um, and so I just wanted to raise that concept with you all. If that would satisfy the open meeting a lot. I would think so. Yeah, but well, we just need to confirm that with the solicitor. Mm -hmm. It's my it's understanding that we can't do that, actually. Uh -huh. do, do you <laughs> think so as well, Jim? Um, I think it's a great idea, it, it, but it has been um, shot down in the past. But I, I think it's worth calling him, um, and particularly the, the fact that it's completely public. That mm -hmm. it's, you know, if anybody wants to go and look at it, it's right. like looking at a, into our meeting right here to see what's going on. Exactly. Um, I think, um, but. Okay. I so mean, the other way we could go is <coughs> that I think we, we can work in twos, I believe if we have sections so um, if um, you know somebody has a particular section they can work on that and um, and I think it would be good to have a common document that we can all work on at the same time and be able to view it I guess I mean it'd be nice to, if you know if two people are working on a section and you want to <laughs> you could at least read it prior to the meeting Mm -hmm. and, and see how it's developing. So, um, I say give Alan a call. <laughs> because they, they, there, there are ways that the public can, you know, have access to, you know, the ideas as they're being developed. Exactly. So, um, yep. we're, we're trying to be in the open. Problem is all the thoughts are up here, which mm -hmm. people can't see. Right. And if we put them on a paper or in some yeah. sort of public document, then they can start to see where right. we're going. I believe uh, they could, in addition, uh, even if we have it view only for the public, I believe they, that the public can make comments on the document. Right. If you have view only privileges, you can right. still make add a comment. So in, in a way, we were giving even more access than we would otherwise. Other thoughts? I just want to add that on other boards, and we particularly I'm on the board at Cutchins, we've done a lot of work with Google Docs, and it's mm -hmm. it's super great. I mean, it's very effective for yep. um, uh, developing drafting things. So. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I'm not familiar with it, um, but I, th I think the concern that I would have is everybody's putting stuff in. How do we know what we want to accept or reject? Who's the acceptor rejector? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it can get to be this unwieldy process. Well, does it? Or if we designate, you know, us as the people who can add content, yeah, and other people can just view it and mm -hmm. maybe add it because you can highlight areas and say, I'd like to comment on mm -hmm. that particular phrase. I yeah. think you need to, you know, it could be somebody out in the public, and you know, I think there's a better way to word it. Here's a link to more information on that. And, um, and that appears on the side. And that appears on the side. It doesn't go in, it, so it becomes a resource, it becomes information for us to create the draft. Does that, everyone that sees it, sees that information that's on the side? The I comments? think they do, they would see the, the comments. So again, that would. Yeah, I'm not familiar with Google Docs, but it's I really can't cool. wait to get it and check it out. <laughs> it's great, yeah. I'm wondering if we should have a template format of what we're, I mean, when I think we're supposed to make recommendations to city council, mm -hmm. uh, how, what, what format or template would that? Of have? the report. Yeah, oh, okay. um, the, just as opposed to starting with one page. So yeah, that's, that's a great. 
at some point we could, um, after we get our research done, to see, okay, it looks like we need to recommend chemicals, or it looks like we need to, you know, whatever it is. I'm worried sections. that we're kind of descending into a conversation that wasn't on the agenda. I don't think we put, you know, format of the report on the agenda, is it on there? It's not. So this is under new business, and um, I brought it up because I just wanted to get yeah. people's initial reaction to having a conversation with Alan Seawood. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that new part's okay. New business is when you kind of bring up that you want something to happen at another meeting. <laughs> You're not actually allowed to bring up anything and discuss it at length. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're just we're just going a little beyond the. the all right, so, so for uh, under new business for a future meeting, we will discuss format for our report. How's that? Sounds great. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Any other reporting back um, that we want to do right now? Well, I, I just want to add that um, Cindy and I were to be working on reaching out to city departments. That was kind of, but you have done an amazing job. The, the, so thank you for taking over that. And you know, it's just, oh, it looks like Dell's just doing it. Okay, great. This is getting done. All I did was follow the mayor's I know, I know. instructions. Well, we had come up with some system yeah. where, you know, we were going to reach out, we we're going to have a list, and then you just went and did it. So thank you. <laughs> well, I think we... But we take credit. <laughs> we, decided, we decided to do it. I, I'm sort of like, okay, I don't have to do that because we're going to do it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad that we're doing it this way. Yeah. Well, and remember, what we said was that if we could not complete all the interviews mm -hmm. doing it this way, that then we would be going to an alternative plan B, which would involve you guys reaching out. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how well this is going to work because we have so little detail back from the mayor's office about who's attending. We don't know who's coming going to okay. show up at 11 o'clock. Oh, we don't okay. know who's going to come to these other uh, appointed mm -hmm. times. We don't know if they're the right people. Mm -hmm. We don't know if they're going to be able to provide us with the information we want so, or need. So we're going to find out. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully it will, it will get everything we need from these interviews. And you guys will be off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just wondering if um, under this section that we're on right now, reporting back. Um, so I gave you the Andover and the Marlboro policy. So we'll, my report back is interacting with the tox Toxic Action Group to find to make some connections. So I, can, I think we'll talk about that. Right now. And I did send those out last night yeah. after mm -hmm. I read them and realized that you know they were pretty easy to read and mm -hmm. very interesting. Yes. Uh, so, um, okay. I and have one more task. So, report back is really brief. I um, also was tasked with contacting the Mass Municipal Association to see if they have any kind of database of what other municipalities are doing. And this is relevant, I guess, to your task. And they don't. And in fact, they sent me like a whole long thing that had details about every organization I've been in touch with, with for years. So. But they don't, they don't create a database of municipalities and you know, how they manage their green spaces. So they're in a dead end. And um, do you suppose they would ever consider having a whole session on this topic at one of their meetings where uh, all the municipalities are there? I, because I that, think that, so. that's related. Yeah. Um, perhaps that would lead to creating a database. Yeah. But it would certainly raise the issue. So I would love to see that happen. Great idea. So like a presentation at the MMA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. I would go see that. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be delivering it again at the select committee. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now that we have that planned. Um, and of course there are other municipalities that are way ahead of us who would love to right. join you at the podium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do think, um, I think I volunteered for this, to, to um, uh, contact the Mass, Mass Association for Boards of Health. Um, I haven't done that, but I'm going to a training with them um, in a couple of 
week, so um, I'll be talking to them there. It's a training on just Board of Health stuff. But I would think if anybody has something, mm -hmm. or at mm -hmm. least a sense of uh, what's going on. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> that would be They're pretty good. Yeah. 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 So, wonderful. When is that? Um, it's actually on a Saturday. I want to say October 5th. If I okay, so it's in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and well, as uh, you all saw, because I've sent all this out, we do have all the dates reserved for our meetings that are going to occur every two weeks in this room. Um, and we also have reserved the rooms for the two public forums. October 16 and October 23. So we are at least set from the scheduling department. Perfect. Excuse me, but yeah. I'm having computer issues right now and I'm going to get it fixed, but I thought I remembered reading somewhere that one of the meetings was not going to be in here. Oh, that's true. It was somewhere mm -hmm. else. Yep. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got that. It's the October 16th forum, which is going to be at the second floor hearing room in City Hall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Everything else is going to be here. All right, so we move into a discussion of those forums. Uh, we have two items. One is uh, format and uh, publicity, and the other one is invitations. So let's talk about what format we might like to use for those forums. One possibility is we just have we allot a certain number of minutes to each person who wishes to speak. And then we need to decide whether we want the format to be that we are just listening or that we are interacting. Um, well, I, I expect that we would be interacting and asking questions, and um, that um, that we're investigating, and we're not. Um, I, I don't think we're, we want to model ourselves after a city council meeting, but more out of, out, um, like a um, like a subcommittee for council and uh, um, where the public can interact with what's being discussed. We, you know, if there's a lot, I, it's often up to the chair as to how that is gonna happen. Uh, that, you know, if there's a lot of people, then you may wanna say, well, we're gonna do a time limit on public comment. Um, that, um, and so you gotta kind of figure out what's going on in the room. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm. In, Expecting, you know, we might get, you know, 10 to 15 people. There'll be plenty of time for people to speak, um, and um, so that's that's my thought on the way we should interact. So it sounds like you might be in favor of a time limit for the that whole segment, which would include us asking, uh, interacting. With well, you know, that I I think we. Um, <coughs> Again, you have to kind of figure out what's going on in the room, but I, I would I would imagine that um, uh, that the uh, that we can have a, a free exchange with with people when they're presenting, and that um, and I I just you know some people are going to go long, some people are going to be short and say thank you for your work and sit down and I agree with whatever was said there. Um, and then some people are going to have expertise that we're going to want to follow up on and find more about. So I, I think us being able to have a free exchange is, is fine. When you, when you say free exchange, do you mean during the presentation you can stop them, ask questions? Well, if somebody from the public's here and they say, hey, I want to thank you for what you're doing, here's what I do in my business, I run a, I do a gardening service, here's some things that I've done, you know, that have been really helpful. And you know, and we can be taking note of that, and that that's the kind of information we want to be able to bring into our report and hand off to um, city departments. So um, I think Kate is asking, 
are you, do you have in mind that we would be able to question that person and say, well, we'd like to hear a little more about yeah, that, more detail about that. Yeah. yeah. So during during the presentation, we could ask yes. clarifying questions or whatever. I I agree with that approach. Uh, you guys, what do you think? I would agree with that approach as well. I think the challenge is going to be um, we're going to invite some people. Mm -hmm. Well, I see that next on here, and I'm wondering if mm -hmm. we. You know, if we're going to break those yeah. things down, you know, are we going to invite them to one yeah, of our meetings right, like this, right. or have them participate in the public forum? So we probably should sort of decide that because I mean I think there'll be some people that we really want to engage with, mm -hmm. and other people would be thank you very much, and and so you have to gauge the room. Oh my God, we have 50 people here, and we don't know, so we're going to have to have a plan right. as to how we're going. So we need to be fair. So if yeah, if we're inviting, w when we talked about inviting people, it was to the forums. We never talked about inviting individuals to these meetings. Okay, that's how that's my recollection. And we can always change that if we want to. But assuming that we're going to invite them to a forum, we would have to tell them, and you have a certain number of minutes to present, and we'll be happy to take any written materials that you mm -hmm. provide. So it seems like we should be fair to everyone and give everyone the same amount of time. Whether they take it or not is up to them. But I, We've done um, kind of a hybrid, I think, in the past. We did a series of hearings on the downtown economy a few years ago, the city council, and we had particular invited presenters that I think we gave something like 15 minutes to um, two or three and then we opened it up to the public and we didn't set a time limit and it, it worked out. As um, Councillor Nash said, some people will, you know, take like 10 minutes but a lot of people will, you know, be quite succinct and so it, it worked out. S and having invited guests to the two different forums gives them a little bit of um, latitude of choice in terms of which of the meetings they can come to. Mm -hmm. So we could have maybe two or three invited people at one and two or, and then two and two or three invited people at the other one mm -hmm. and then it would be open to the public for the rest. We might not get a huge number of people. I mean it depends a lot on the outreach that I know we're going to talk about too but. Well Think of how many people came to the to CPC meeting where there was the grant request for using pesticide in the public garden. It's true, and that's exactly what I was going to say. We have a couple of kind of hot button issues right now around pesticide use by mm -hmm. the city that will garner a lot of interest and attention. Mm -hmm. I would, I would expect that those same people would show up at one of our forums. I, I could be wrong. And. You know, maybe we, we should set a limit then. And I think it's okay to say these are invited experts and they have 10 minutes or 15 minutes and then um, for the public, you know, we have, we have three minutes a piece or something so that we're not, you know, risking being mm -hmm. overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I would agree to having a time limit for both the invited people and for the public and they, could, they don't have to be exactly the same number of minutes but um, some people can go on and on and on you know uh, yes and it's not helpful and it's an emotional issue for a lot of people yeah so um, did we create a list of who the invited people were no we yeah. were hoping I think to do that today because so I mentioned us a few names. how much time we'll have Pardon me? If we identify them, it'll help us know how much time we have. Well, uh, do you have any objection to sliding into to, to combining these two agenda items and talking about who, who, how many people we're inviting? Seems to make sense. Uh, any objection to that? Okay, so in the past we talked about uh, Rich Jasky for representing um, agriculture, um, Bernadette um, Gibbon. Uh, representing organic management. Len Cohen, who was a um, retired chemist who applied to be a member. 
and he was going to maybe address um, issues related to Broadbrook Coalition, but there's also Bob Zimmerman, uh, the president of the Broadbrook Coalition, was interested as well. Okay. Um, would it be useful for me to look at the list of applicants? Because there were a few of those people that were not selected by the city council president that we thought we um, we felt like we should give time to. Absolutely. All right. Just open that up. And Bernadette's expertise again will be It has to do with lawn care, turf, turf management. Turf management. Um, although I think, I think she knows a lot more than just mm -hmm. about turf. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Michael Skillicorner, anybody oh, I right. think from Grow Food Northampton. Right. Right. So invite Grow Food Northampton essentially to do something. Mm -hmm. Michael Skillicorn, it's S K I L L I K O R N. I don't think we necessarily need to have him. The reason he applied was because he was the only Northampton resident of the, on the staff and it, he needed to be a Northampton resident, so Cole oh. might want to come. Or, <laughs> so I think we actually need to just issue it to to grow food Northampton more broadly. Yeah, okay. Great. And I think Maggie Leonard, is that, is that the name right? Yeah, I don't know who that is. Who's she that? does um, uh, landscape design. Oh. Landscape design and, and, and I think a garden care business. Okay. So. Uh, and then one more, the, there's nobody else on the uh, <coughs> list, but uh, somebody from the pollinator group, Peggy McLeod, or um, one of those folks mm -hmm. wanted to speak about neonicotinoids and um, okay, and just creating pollinator-friendly spaces. Okay, and I, that's, that's, that's everyone that I had thought of. I think really. Okay, well, that's not very many people. Um, Actually wasn't, and we did extensive outreach to them. Larry Cochran Larry, um, mm -hmm. might be interested, but the problem that we have there is that she took a very particular stand, right. and then the people who took the other stand will, if they're not uh -huh. an invited guest. So uh, to me, that's more kind of members of the public, mm -hmm. personally. And I mean, I, I get where you're going, but I think. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just, I think we're going to get into a lot of politics that could be troubling and I think if we offer the community at large a chance to come and speak, those people from the community gardens who want to come can come, but casting them as experts, mm -hmm. I, we're, we're essentially inviting this political, very kind of intense political battle into mm -hmm. the room and I don't know if that actually will give us the kind of information we need. Mm -hmm. Is there some one person that's in charge or oversees the whole of the community gardens? Well, that's Le Larry Cochran would be the... She's a co-coordinator. Co-coordinator of the... And the co-coordinators um, wanted to use Roundup on this particular, on Japanese knotwood on a particular space, but many of the very active members who aren't co-coordinators were against it, so there's there was a huge clash and very painful. Yeah. So, um, so I think what I'm hearing is that um, to avoid that, we would just invite the public. 
rather than inviting That's one side suggest. or both sides mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that acceptable? It, maybe it's, it's my, it's the term expert. I mean, we've been mm -hmm. playing around with this term, but maybe the minutes don't have to say expert. Invited guests. Yes. yes. Invited yeah. guests, um, mm -hmm. interested parties, general public, that you know, covers every yeah. event. That sounds, that sounds good. Yeah, I think that's a really good thinking there. Um, perhaps we could even phrase it as people who showed interest in this committee right. and um, have, have contacted us. Inviting all of them either, though. So, no, no. no there are others that were invite that submitted applications that I don't think we necessarily want to invite to give a you know, 15 minute presentation. I see. Okay. I think that we will send out, when we send out our outreach, we'll send it out to all of those oh, okay. people okay. to come and so speak. Outreach would, would, so outreach would go to everyone who expressed interest or contacted us and the general public. Okay. Yeah, I would say of these six people, these were applicants who were interested in pesticide reduction. And that I think there was at least one advocate or, or one applicant who was not so interested in pesticide reduction. So um, it seemed counter to what our discussion is. They're welcome to come in, yeah. speak to <laughs> us, you know. And why would they? Why would they apply to a pesticide reduction committee if they weren't interested in pesticide reduction? I'm just curious. Um, so the, the, there was a gentleman who was very interested that he has a business where he does pest control and that, um, and that, he's, uh, that he, he's, of, he's, he's of the mind that you know, current regulations are fine and that, um, that the regulations, um, uh, if followed, will result in um, you know, people being safe in general. And that, um, that I think what we're exploring is ways to make the regulations more safe. So um, <laughs> that, um, that more, uh, that the idea of reducing pesticides, this committee is dedicated to the idea of reducing pesticides and, and not keeping them at, at the same level. So um, I do think that the gentleman is following regulations and is you know, doing his, his work by the letter of the law. And, um, but that's not what we're exploring. With good reason. <laughs> Thanks. Can okay. I give you the list that we've had so far? Yes, to please. To make sure um, not in the political. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rich Jasky for agriculture, and Deb Giblin for turf management. Bob Zipperman for a broad, broad book. Grab Brook, you know, some type of a rep, someone who can represent our food. Maggie Leonard, uh, Peggy McLeod, the pollinator group, community garden representatives. I think we just decided not to invite the community garden representative because that would be so divisive. Okay. As as a speaker, but as there a, will be invited to. Yes, absolutely, the, as part of the public. And then we did also mention Lynn Cohen. Uh, right, that wasn't Mr. Cohen also for a book? Or no, did I? He, he was the name, just because the Bob Zimmerman wasn't able, because of time commitments, to be on the committee, um, they put him forward as the person who would kind of represent the interests to some degree of Broadbrook, but he also has a, a, a um, very extensive background, I guess, in um, pesticide. Does okay. so anyone know if it's C-O-H-E-N? It is. Here are the names, actually. Okay. So are we in agreement that we would be inviting a, a, a both both Len Cohen and Bob Zimmerman? Um, but we could also let them decide. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, there might not be a reason to, I mean, I was just kind of feeling because he applied, uh, kind of giving him the respect of an applicant, as it were, but um, if we're covering Broad Brooks' perspective, that might be enough, I don't, I don't know. Could we send an invitation to the two of them and say, 
we understand that um, it may make sense for one of you to represent Broad Group, but if you feel that you have two different perspectives, then Sounds feel free to both testify. So we have our um, we have our invitation tentative invitation list. Um, how about how do we want to get the publicity out? I think a letter to the editor, maybe by the chair and co-chair, signed by the chair and the co-chair, is always a good way to reach a certain part of the population via the Gazette. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need posters. Posters. I think posters. we need posters. It, seriously, that's it's mm -hmm. been useful in the past. I mean, not a whole lot of them, but certainly put them up, you know, around City Hall. And, I um, have to City say Hall. that I remember when, um, whatever it was called, the big event in Florence this summer. Um, not first I think night. Florence Night Out. Yes, exactly. And I was asking them how they publicize it because at first it didn't seem like anybody was coming and I was mm -hmm. so concerned. And then boom, a whole flood of people. They did not do posters. The Gazette was too expensive. They used Facebook. Oh, yeah, social media. Okay, okay. So social media. Social media. We didn't get there yet, but yeah. I'm not on Facebook, but that yeah, appears to be extremely <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can ask the mayor's that. office to put a yeah. notice on the home page of the city. But we need to design a poster too that um it's Facebook friendly. Yeah, yeah. everything friendly. Uh, okay, who uh, who's going to recommend a designer for the poster? I have a good friend who's a graphic designer, and she will do it for us. I'm sure. Sure. Yay. You know Heidi Stevens. Yeah, shameless plug. She's an amazing graphic designer, and she's very civic minded, and she does all kinds of wonderful posters for. That's great. All, all right. So, um, do we have a budget? No. Y yes. That's the next question, isn't it? <laughs> um, do we have any? Yeah. Right. Okay. So, if it's electronic, then we don't need money, and if she's donating her services, but if we're going to print them, we do need some money. I'd be happy to pay for the printing. Thanks. Not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. I'll well, we can pass a hat. How about we pass the hat? <laughs> Do that. Uh, oh, and, and then, of course, the question is, are we doing color or are we doing black and white? What size? Uh, we'll let that, we'll leave that up to the... We're not going to do a huge amount of posters. Okay. What do you pick? Like 20? I was thinking like 20, 25. Yeah. Like three or four in downtown Florence, a few around here in downtown, but we also have to pick them up. That's true. But social media really is a kind of the easiest way to go, I would say. It's the most au courant, modern way oh, of doing it. It is. It is. Oh, and, um, the other thing is um, for free, you can do those listings in the Gazette, the, the Valley Advocate, uh, right. um, the Republican. They just all have online processes now where you just put the information in on their websites. Okay, do we have a volunteer who is willing to take on posting this for free in the Gazette and the Valley Advocate? And the Republican, I'd say. Does, do you think anyone from Northampton actually reads the Republican? My neighbors and leads do. Okay, do yeah. then. Let's do it. Okay. Well, I was going to volunteer to put the poster, so. Okay, thank you. That's great. <laughs> so, they really. Can really do that for free? What? Is it Valley Advocate? That's just those listings, like on the in the Friday section with all the events happening. Oh, those it's not. It's it's not like creating an gotcha. ad or anything that would cost a lot of money. Gotcha, gotcha. But a letter to the editor, of course, is free. That's a good way to get the word out that you don't have to pay for. Um, so I can do the free 
the listings in the Gazette Valley Advocate and the Public. All right. Thank you. Um, and then Jim is going to be here. What? And we're going to do the legwork on here. Putting the posters up. Yep. He's going to go around with thumbtacks. Yeah. Posted and posted. Okay. Uh, I'll is there a bullet board at the community gardens? There is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's I, a, there's I imagine at most locations. Yeah, there's a shed. And Both on the side, them? there's a bullet board. The organic one, too? Is that which one are you talking about? I'm talking about the Northampton uh, community garden. Then the one at um, the growth of the Northampton organic community garden, uh, I haven't been there in a while. But I haven't been either of them in a while, but I believe there is uh, also a bullet board there which is under um, a, a weather protector thingy. Great. So um, you drive around will you, are you going to go to both of those? I will Indian? go to both. Yeah. All right. Um, I like driving around. That reminded me when you said that about <laughs> Grove Fisher of Hampton and Del, that another thing is just using, leveraging kind of all these organizations that are interested in what we're doing and Grow Food Northampton could maybe, they, maybe they'd be willing to send something out to their constituency. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should brainstorm other organizations in town that you know send out email blasts that might want to let people know. Go Food Northampton's an obvious one. Are there any others? Broadbrook, they have a yeah. The Lead Civic Association, I'm sure, would be happy to send something out. Well, also, the, all of us counselors yeah. have listservs for our wards. Almost right. all, not all. <laughs> I've learned. Right, not all. <laughs> The word, the word lists. Um, okay. Senior center. And I suppose we could, yeah. we could. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> there is a list of gardeners for both gardens, where, where they they have, you know. So we could ask both gardens to circulate to their gardeners. And I'm I, sure that I, Peggy yeah. McLeod has a has an entire list. Sir. She does. She yeah. does. And I, when I was um, doing outreach to try and get people to apply, I developed a pretty extensive. It's probably about a hundred, maybe ninety people, something like that. Mm -hmm. And and what you always should do when you send out, I mean, all of us will send out to our friends and contacts in Northampton and say, please forward this onward to any listservs or any interested individuals, and that way it'll just take on a life of its own, I think. Sounds like we might have quite a crowd. <laughs> we could. Uh, yeah, we could, and it, um, you know, that'll make it more challenging to fit everybody in who wants to speak, but, but perhaps people will say, well, I, what I wanted to say has already been said. Right. Um, okay, then we, once we have this poster, we could also ask the mayor whether he's willing to tweet and Facebook it because he's got quite a following. Okay. Um, well, there are other city listservs. DPW has a listserv. Um, Planning and Sustainability sends out notices all the time. So, I mean, we could ask all the city departments to do that too. Oh boy, okay. All right, uh, well, I'll draft a letter to the editor, and then I'll, um, let's see, can I circulate that to, I know I can circulate it to you, uh, Cynthia, but I don't know if I can circulate it to all five of us, according to the open meeting law. Probably not. If we <laughs> talk about it at one of our meetings, we look it over at one of our meetings. Okay, so we can just have that, because we're meeting in two weeks. Right. So yeah, if you have a draft, then we can send it out and okay. then we wait in as a committee. Excellent. Okay. Well, we certainly have generated plenty of uh, what are the dates and our things? October 16th and, and the 23rd. So a question I have, if I'm going to work with Heidi to develop a poster, um, do you 
do you feel okay with me coming up with language for it? Should I, because again, we have that issue with open meeting law that I can't send it out. I mean, I can send it out and you guys can send me individual comments. Be sure that you don't reply to all, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that okay. So I'll do that and when the poster's done, Heidi will, you know, let me circulate it amongst you and any comments on the poster itself and, okay, great. Make sure you have a skull and bones on there. <laughs> Any inflammatory imagery, <laughs> like dead children or something. <laughs> yeah. Get their attention. <laughs> That's a good reminder, Elisa. Anything any of us send to everyone, we can comment just back to that individual, mm -hmm. as opposed to reply. Mm -hmm. In fact, pre we have a practice with city councilors that if we send something like that at, that out, we always have a quick reminder that says, you know, an abundance of caution, please remember not to reply to all. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. It's a good practice because otherwise you sometimes forget. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, we'll try to remember to include that sentence in every one of our communications. Okay. Okay. I would think the poster is the first thing we get off the Yeah. I think that's very important. And I guess the only thing that I would be, that people know city council, and they see that we're city kind of, but we're not really, that all this body is doing is making a change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I wonder if we have, we do have somewhere um, language that was created, I mean, we have the resolution that created this, but. I'm going to see if I can find like one sentence that mm -hmm. just kind of explains the mandate of this mm -hmm. committee to include on the poster yeah. so I can put that. Yeah. But There's it is called there. essentially the, the City Council Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction. And then I'll just have one sentence with the mandate, talk about the public forums, the dates, try and keep it as yeah. uncluttered as possible. I would stop reading after the word council. You know, it's the City Council. <laughs> Pesticides. <laughs> that, you know, just like you know what I mean. It's just like because I don't live in this world. <laughs> well, you don't have to. You don't have to really. You could say you could have an asterisk at the bottom yeah, that what talks it, what about how this, this was created by the city council. You don't have to have it in the yeah. large letters. All right. Heidi Pesticide in large yeah. letters. What'd you say? Heidi, the designing will know. Should, yeah. Don't lead with city council. <laughs> yeah. city council select committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, are there other issues we should talk about about the forums? So the format is going to be that we'll, would, would, we would have, um, we did agree, I believe, that we're going to um, give our invitees some sort of time frame. Mm -hmm. Like, I would suggest 10 minutes is a long time. Mm -hmm. We suggest 10 minutes to the, our invitees. And that's for their presentation. Mm -hmm. And then if we have questions, it could actually go a little bit longer. Yeah. Does that sound right? I, I, I agree with that. Okay. How does the rest of us feel? So when we say to an invitee, we want you to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. we, we'll say, um, what do you want me to, how do you do this? As opposed to, we want you to comment, which I think. Well, I think the, the, the term we were using is to provide testimony. Okay. Because you were interested in being part of this discussion and we want to hear what you have to say. Okay. We're interested okay. in that. All right. And um, if they want to do a presentation or they just want to say, great work, whatever, that's what their testimony is. So how about if I draft the text of an invitation? And again, we have to decide how we're going to ham handle that. Um, is our next meeting enough time um, to finalize the wording of the invitation? October what? Sixteenth is the first one. Yeah. So uh, today's the ninth. I mean, I feel like I trust you to yeah 
run with something. Yeah. I don't know if we need to micromanage every word that comes out of our mouths, personally. Ooh, okay, I'm going to run. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well. Uh, we are going to put a skull and crossbones on Um. Well, I would feel better about uh, getting some comments back. So let's think about how we could do that. I could. S I, is it is it okay from the open meeting law perspective for me to send it out my draft and then you each reply directly to me and nobody else? Okay. Okay. I would say just broadly to start. Maybe this is obvious. You know your your interest in. You're in this city reducing pesticides mm -hmm. and what your recommendations would be to the city because that, I think that's broad enough that they can do with it what they want but it's narrow enough that they understand kind of what we want to hear. Hi, right, right, on. right on time. Well, that's good. <laughs> Early. We know oh, you get this. extra credit. Oh, good. I think I did who the representative is <laughs> we Wayne. we know that uh, yes uh, are you are you representing your department at, at, alone there's nobody else coming okay great um, okay we've been on tenter hooks wondering who would come from your department <laughs> <laughs> well we didn't get any feedback from Lynn about who was going no, just gotcha. what days who would you know, what departments would be represented so Sure. All right. So, uh, are we ready to make a transition mm -hmm. to talking to Wayne? Yeah. Can we take like a two-minute break? Sure. Okay. Cool. All right, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna set that alarm to see if. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the new alarm is horrendous. Oh, it's <laughs> Yeah. So, when Wayne, I kind of no idea how this works. Vision last night, like somebody like we do this chemical thing, and I'm putting all these chemicals, and I'm like, I don't even know what we're saying. Well, well, if it gets complicated, what's... then we'll ask for something. To write so we should, time. yeah. So and we have it on tape. Yeah. 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 But I mean, in terms of the minutes, can I say? That might actually give you my <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Or this can be attached as a show. Yeah, copy. Oh, okay. And um, just need some So, uh, when you, will you send this electronically? Sure. Uh, so that it can be attached to the minutes? Yep. Thank you. Send it to who? Um, well, <clears throat> Cynthia is, good, is our minutes person, okay. uh, so you can send it directly to her. Okay. Uh, if you, do you have her email? Uh, if it's on the paper trail, the past emails from Lynn? Uh, it might be, and if not, you can send it to me, and then I will send it to her, and I'll, or okay. I, you know. Okay. I don't remember if... Um, Lynn copied everybody or not. I'm, I'm, she might not have. No, you forwarded something to us. Yeah, I think I forwarded it. Did you lose, lose sleep all weekend preparing for this presentation? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, thank goodness. I, mean, I know I should be stressed up here before you, but I wasn't. Do you know everybody here? Oh. My name is Kate Simmons. Oh, excuse me. Wait, nice hi. to meet you, Wayne. So when we, uh, w when Jim comes back, we're way back. Oh, okay. Um, you're welcome to to test to talk with us in, in what whatever way is most comfortable for you, sitting, standing, whatever. You know, okay. We're not um, yeah, wedded to formality okay. here. We need it on camera though, so somewhere the camera will pick up. Okay. Just that one, or that one working too? Just that one. Okay. Which is your best side? <laughs> <laughs> well, if in, in city council meetings, um, people are generally not on camera, right? 
the audience. Well, the, uh, right. Well, the, when they stand oh, the up, up, they the, sure are. Uh -huh. Yeah. The, from the back. Well, Councilman, these are all live. Yeah, so we have behind cameras it. that are motion activated. And we have a person oh. in the booth all the time who's like, oh, I didn't even know. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> in fact, We're it's nervous. really interesting when someone's at the podium and people are sitting and they don't kind of realize that they're on camera. Like, you can see people kind of engaging in interesting practices. <laughs> you watch the meetings. You know, people sleeping or picking their nose. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, so you got to <laughs> the next time I, I get, I don't have anything else to do. I think I'll tune right in to one of those you know, old, old meetings. Start watching. Them. Okay, our break is officially over, and uh, Wayne, we would love to hear from you about what pesticides are used by. Your department, um, um, is our understanding that um, you oversee both farmland and uh, conservation land. Is there anything else? Uh, some of the bike path as well. Bike path. So yeah, let me, I, I'll, I, let me do a quick summary and sort of take you over. Thank you. Do you want to sit or with us or be? Whatever works for you, I don't care. Which is more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, we want you to be comfortable. Okay. <laughs> so, Roughly, um, about 15% of the city, that's not the exact number, is land that's owned by the Conservation Commission that my office is charged with maintaining. So, um, so it's a big land mass. That includes some farmland that we lease, about five parcels that we lease. Most of it is more pristine property. Um, and Wayne, you're sitting in a place that's exactly not on camera. Oh, yeah. So if you could either move maybe next to Jim or... Sure, that works. I suspected that the podium was blocking you, and it was. Okay, Thank sorry. You. Um, so that, that conservation land, that say roughly 15% of the city is our primary responsibility. And then Department of Public Works is the primary agency for maintaining the bike path. But my office, the office that builds bike paths and we're wedded to the success, does a lot of work keeping them alive. And so in particular, Japanese not read along the bike path. We've been doing some work there. Um, so, so we do all those areas. I, I just want to preface by saying that we are, I, I like the name of the committee as being new pesticide reduction. Our goal has been to use as little pesticides as possible. And so I went, I, I'll walk you through the memo in a second, but our goal is to always look for alternatives for pesticides when we can. We're trying to, to reduce it. Um, but we also think basically it's impossible not to use some pesticides and herbicides. Um, and so we're not pure. So I, again, this is an the later, but I'll just give you one quick example. We had Japanese not believe at Mineral Hills. And so, so we, you're here, when I go through this, but we tend to think of sort of big environmental footprint. Don't just look at pesticides in isolation. Think about the context of the base. So we had Japanese not weed stand at Mineral Hills. Some of my office, we have a licensed applicator in my office. Some of my office went up there and physically cut it and then pinched the stems or sprayed the stems um, and calculated if we did it all mechanical, which means allowing it to re sprout, the number of trips he would take to come back to treat it would use about a gallon of gasoline as opposed to about two and a half ounces of pesticides. So even ignoring the resources, we sort of look at that and say, actually, environmental footprint is less to treat it once with two and a half ounces of herbicide than it is to have however many trips a gallon of gasoline is, and of course, that we can't do other places. So, so that's sort of been our basic context is how do we do as little as possible while accepting that we need to do some? And that's sort of the typical practice for our peer organizations. So Max Audubon, who's obviously, a, you know, believes in the environment, they use herbicide in some areas. Grow Food Northampton um, has asked us, can we control the, or the invasive? So we have about a half mile, three quarter of a mile edge at the Grow Food Northampton of land that we own. And if Japanese not, we in particular leaves our properties going onto the field. You know, and so how do we catch those things up front so it's not endangering the field? So that's been our, our biggest area is trying to catch these invasives. Could you back up for one second? Yeah. So did, have they requested um, that you do 
control the Japanese not win? We uh, haven't got to that state yet. Okay. Um, both Clem Clay uh, as executive director and Gabby Ehrman, who I'm not sure she still is, but used to be chair of the board, um, sort of clearly we're okay with you using herbicides. So I can't say with the board itself, I don't know the answer, but we're okay with you doing herbicides. This is going to be an issue at some point. We haven't yet gotten there. We have a focus. We haven't done, we haven't done any treatment there. Okay. But um, this came up for the community gardens off Bridgeport Road, where Clem was very upset about people saying we should never use any herbicides any time and wrote a letter saying there are appropriate places and inappropriate places for when you're talking about Japanese now, are you talking specifically about glyphosate based products or something else? So my pronunciation is going to be horrible, but glyphosate and trichlorpyrrole, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I'm not the herbicide person in the office. So we use both of them. They serve similar roles. They're very different. We, you know, everything in the world that has a brand name often is one or the other one of those things. Um, but the people in my office who use, we've had over time, three different license applicators. So we have, we have one right now. And I leave it to them to select. They, for some reason, like that second one. When you say glyphosate, are you, are you talking about Roundup? Roundup's a brand name. So it shows up in a lot of different products Correct. that are out there. But it turns um, out it's the most widely used. Right. We're not world. using Roundup right now. We're okay. using this trichlor. Right. But when you say glyphosate, which part are you referring to? I'm not sure the answer to that. Okay. Um, but okay. It's not Roundup just by chance, we've been using this other product recently. I guess I bring it up because it turns out that Roundup itself has glyphosate and it turns out that it's in a formulation of surfactant that's very toxic itself and they actually act in synergy to be horrendous. Okay. So the glyphosate might pass all these toxicity tests well, put in combination with the surfactant. Okay. You're clearly beyond my knowledge, so I don't know the answer okay. to that. Okay. You know, my sort of, my, my job is figure out where we're willing to use the chemicals and where we're not, explore the alternatives somebody else in my office applies, and so I would leave it to them and sort of what decision they make for it. But as of right now, not use them. Right. The so, so there's sort of three, three ways they get you, four ways we apply things. So um, we do direct application for my office, and we're far below a liter per year for that, and that's this other trichlor, again, mispronouncing, that we actually apply ourselves. And so that, no, we're not using Roundup. Then some of our partners, sometimes with CPA money, sometimes other sources, have hired people to apply, and so we have less direct control. Our Brook Brook Coalition, for example, so I don't know exactly what they do. Um, then we lease some farmland, and it's a similar thing. Right now, we only have one piece. Of, so we, we have several pieces of farmland. Only one is uh, using inorganic methods. I don't know exactly what they apply for, for the efforts. So it, it varies depending on, on where we are. So I only know the stuff that we're actually purchasing. Yeah. Wait, can you explain, kind of step back a few steps and just explain the relationship of the city to the agricultural areas that um, that you're talking about? Sure. So part of our job is to preserve as much farmland as possible. Our, to, you know, for future generations for food. Our policy is when land is pure farmland, we don't want to own the property. We'd rather remain in farmers' hands and leave them to the manage decision. So generally we're buying what's called agricultural preservation restrictions. That is a permanent restriction that keeps in farmland, but we're not involved with the management decisions. We buy farmland primarily, well, either when there's no other purchaser out there, and it's likely to buy fallow otherwise, or when it's part of a bigger acquisition. So Mineral Hills Conservation Area is about close to 1,000 acres of land, and we have about 25 acres of farmland. So we bought it as part of a bigger piece. So generally that's our pattern. You know, Connecticut River Greenway is 200 and some odd acres, and we have 15 acres. So the city for the Mineral Hills, as an example, has bought this land, 25 acres, is farmland, and the farmer that you bought it from is managing it? No, so different farmer. So we have a farmer, we do lease it, uh, licenses. We only do licenses, we only, well, with one exception, we generally only do licenses that are up for good for up to three years. Um, so the, the, it's sort of convoluted procurement, but when we own land, 
and didn't anticipate doing licenses up front, the maximum we're allowed to do is a three-year license. Sometimes when we buy land, we plan ahead of time, and we know we can do a longer term piece. Um, we have sort of a couple policies for farmland. One is we do a case-by-case -case assessment of how sensitive the site is. So the land we own in the Connecticut River, we do that as organic only because we're very worried floods regularly and we're very worried about chemicals going to the river. So we haven't allowed that to be used for chemicals. Um, and so that's, that's our default. We think about what it is. The two times when chemicals make sense for us one is we have a policy worked out with the Ag Commission that we'd like to preserve. When I first got here, there were two dairy farms in Northampton. And as the dairy farm shrunk, we have no, no dairy farms now, the whole infrastructure collapses. So you can't just have one dairy farm. It's not worth the milk trucks driving around. We're very sensitive about being responsible for that. So we want to allow historical farm use to continue. So the one area which we allow in organic treatment is on um, Sylvester Road, um, and that's because the farmer Parsons um, farms it, and it's not you know he's an you know it's not like along the Connecticut River where there's 3,000 acres of farmland. There's only a few farm parcels out in the western part of the city and the eastern part of West Hampton, and we're always worried if you lose a farm at some at some land to farm, at some point you go below the threshold to keep your operation viable, uh, and so we don't want to threaten his operation. Frankly. We, we want to keep farmers there. So that's sort of the second one. The, the other criteria, which hasn't come up a lot, but be my priority is this again is the total environmental footprint. You can control weeds in lots of ways in a pure organic way, but you can't really do organic farming for um, soybeans, potatoes, that in, in any large scale. The market doesn't, I mean, obviously the co op sells some of that, but the market doesn't really reward that. Um, no till agriculture is where instead of plowing the soil and turning over the sod, you're basically just doing a furrow through, this, through the area and um, you're not getting rid of the weeds by, by turning it over. It's been out there for 45 years, but it still hasn't gained a lot of acceptance with farmers. Um, it has dramatically less soil erosion. You know, if you think of, it takes 500 years on the average to create an inch of soil. Um, no till has a lot less erosion, a lot less loss of carbon sequestration. And no-till to me is a really high priority. No-till, again, they're organic practices, but no-till is more likely to include herbicide than till. Um, and so from that standpoint, we will do almost anything to encourage no-till. So we would probably tolerate some limited herbicides for no-till in a place where we I thought I remembered hearing that it uh, reduces herbicide use as well. That's right. So you don't turn up the soil, you don't expose the seeds to the light, so they don't germinate. That's exactly right, but you do need to have some, some right. sort of control. Right. So no-till is sort of the, the gold standard for us. And again, to be clear, I'm not a farmer. I know nothing about, you know, I, I, I spent my first 10 years in soil conservation before I became a planner, the first eight years. And so I'm very sensitive and have worked with farmers for years. But, um. Well, I, I think it's really important for, for the minutes and for all of us to understand that there are different, people mean very different things when they use the word no-till. And so one way of using that word is, yes, you spray glyphosate on the whole damn field, and, but you're not tilling. Um, and the other, there is a, not, there is a current of, uh, use of the term, which is very restrictive. It's you know, better than organic, um, but it would never allow um, herbicide use. Right. So when we say no-till, it, it, you, know, you have to be really careful how you say it. And what you're saying, how you're using it is that it, it can be done in conjunction with herbicide use. So um, that's right. a very important distinction in my and, mind. And one of our distinctions, so we know that our farm population is sort of bimodal. In terms of acreage, the majority of our farmers make me seem like a really young guy. Um, and they are late 60s, 70s, often don't have transition plans, kids don't want to go into farming, and most of the meadows is those farmers. And if we had this conversation 15 years ago, I would have said that was it for North Hampton farmers. Since then, we have a lot of young farmers coming in, a lot of organic farmers. But in terms of acreage, they're still pretty small. They're mostly not interested in the meadows. Um, and so keeping, you know, keeping farmers alive is really critical to us. And so that, that's, you know, that's why, frankly, for Parsons, we're happy to accept the 
there's some amount of herbicide use out there as we're balancing different goods that are out there. Um, so why aren't they interested in the meadows, the new farmers? Um, harder to control, well, floods more often. Mm -hmm. And that's not such an issue for potatoes and soybeans and corn. It is more of an issue for vegetables. Mm -hmm. You can, the areas that's in a hundred year flood, you know, it's like right along Hockman Road, mm -hmm. that's far enough high and it doesn't flood that often. Right. You know, there is an organic farm, I think it's organic on Cross Path Road, right along the interstate. But as you get lower down, it floods more and more frequently. It just doesn't work as well for crops. Okay. Um, and then it's, you know, it's, it's organic is very labor intensive. If you want to have 150 acre, you know, Wayne Goulet, who has 10 years on me, is farming, I don't know, his acre, 150 acres of land by himself. That's not the sort of work plan you do if you're doing organic. Right. Uh, and then, and so some of it is the floodplain, some is the access, frankly, in terms of robberies, that with is, you know, crops in areas where people drive by have less shrinkage than crops that are out of sight, so that's an issue. Um, and then some is just land tenure. When you believe, for example, has been unwilling to sell his land, you know, or basically hasn't been willing to sell his land, so, um, and so on the last these people so far until they sue each other is keeping the farmland and the family. So, so there are a few landowners in large scales. We've worked most closely with one farmer who's late 60s, um, who doesn't have any kids and has been thinking about his transition plan. So we put that culture preservation restriction on the But they're all different stories. So through an APR, can we, do we get some control over what can be done on that property? So APRs have two flavors. Most of them are funded by the Commonwealth. They pay 90 to 90%, we pay 10 to 20%. Commonwealth would not accept restrictions on herbicides because they, even if you want to be organic, they sort of feel like we're doing this forever for the future. Mm -hmm. um, if we do a local APR that's totally locally funded, we could. Um, we've had the same policy though. We don't want to restrict the future. Even even land that is organic and we want to remain organic, who knows what happens in the future. So you wouldn't recommend using an APR as a right to? Because it's forever. forever. Different when we own land and lease it because we can change our rules. Is there another way you could see controlling that? Or? Well, the state, for example, this isn't about herbicides, but you could imagine the same thing. The state has a shorter term program that's eligible if you're an APR or non APR where they give you some money for improvements. And in return for that money for improvements, they put sticks on it. So, yeah, you could offer a funding program that says, in return for signing up for this program, for the next 10 years, you won't use herbicides. So in farmers yeah. But couldn't the, the city also offer its farmers incentives? Absolutely. Yeah, same, same sort of program. Yeah. Right. Right. Either so. short-term or long-term for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's still a risk of losing those farmers. And, and I will say, I mean, we have had, I love the organic farmers. We've done a lot. We, you know, used to charge rent. We tend now to switch it from rent to labor because that works for some of our farmers. Um, like free labor, you know, a farmer, Parsons, for example. Does some clearing the margins of the field that don't make sense financially in return for getting free rent. The, the organic farm in the Connecticut River cuts some brush and burns the brush for us instead of paying us rent. Um, and so we, we've done those things, but we have never had a failure of a large production farmer, and we have had several failures of organic farmers. Enterprise Farms was the biggest one that failed. Um, we had a big failure in, in Jim's backyard uh, of a local organic farmer. We had a failure on um, uh, Manhattan Road. So, you know, the problem is the farmers... Do you mean town farm or do you mean that, that little space um, next to... Uh, Montview Neighborhood Montview, Farm. Montview, yeah. Which I will frame is a success for about five years. Yeah, I don't disagree. And, and then, yeah. The yeah, thing. but we've just never had that problem on the big organic right. farm. So we're, we're sensitive. We've, we've had, you know, people who left us holding the bag I mean, that, that was a longer term one. We had one on um, Manhattan Road in the Meadows where we have five acres of land of which only one's really valuable. And so our lease price is clear all five acres for us and grow on however much land you can get. And two separate times a farmer walked, we warned them, here's all the conditions out here, and two separate. So, you know, the problem with some of the young organic farmers is they're young and not yet tried and true and, you know, or don't know how I've had difficult farming. So. 
So, we're, so those things will all come into those decisions. Um, so that all fits in. So some of your decisions were, you know, how are the ways that we reduce use? So we used to allow a farmer at Elwell, the, the one at Connecticut River, to use herbicides. We did have a farmer who failed, and the farm was empty for two years. And so we used it as a perfect opportunity that it was then certifiable for organic, but in the time period, it was three years. So we used that as an opportunity to switch to organic, and so far we've been able to find farmers. Once or one enterprise failed, I think we went a year without a farmer, but not so long we had, we had a problem out there. Um, so we've, we've looked at that impossible. We, we still have a problem with mechanized farmers, of what's the turning radius for the tractors. So using the one on Connecticut River, for example, it's almost triangular shaped, and we've had a really hard time for getting people to use the upper triangle. So we hired someone, we cleared lots of invasives, and had to get someone, get someone to farm out over there. Um, we have played, which is a long list on the um, second page of this, all the non-invasive things, I've been all the non-chemical things we've done. Some, to be clear, are not pure. We've looked in combination. So we're doing a goat um, trial right now. We're about to switch to goats and sheep. Um, and it's too early to say how well it works, and, and it's not too early to know it's very expensive and it's only gonna work in places where there's an overwhelming need for it. We did control burns for about 20 years um, in one field, and we stopped that with the retired, Bill Patterson teaches fire ecology, used to teach fire ecology at UMass. When he retired, we were no longer able to find someone to do that. You know, I, we couldn't afford the market rate right, for someone doing that. Mm -hmm but that worked, we hired someone once to actually take full-grown um, <coughs> multi-floral rows and pull them out by the roots. Um, we actually, not on this list, we um, released thousands and thousands of little wasps that eat um, uh, purple loose strife, uh, and then we GPS them for a while to watch the success, and it wasn't particularly successful. That was not got to put it on the list. The wasp. We were trying to, we, we mapped their the, cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> we mapped the purple loosestrife population, then we released these thousands of wasps that are, are only eat purple loosestrife. And loose they're strife. in swarms, so you can watch them that way? No, no the, 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 the loose strife. that they feed on. Oh, right. you're yeah. GPSing the plant. Yeah, the purple loosestrife. Mm -hmm. oh. Right, right. And it wasn't particularly successful. It wasn't unsuccessful. They weren't, you know, the wasps were great because they don't have non-target species. You know, you always hear the stories about something gets released New tree in the south was released for some reason. I don't know the reason you see it everywhere you go. I mean, they're just they're everywhere. The, the thing that was released deliberately became the pest. Wasps are nice because they're pretty narrow in the process. They're not nice. <laughs> they're horrible, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so you know, you see this list, except for the purple loose stripe, I have them everywhere. You know, everything on this list. So we try all those things, and they all work in certain applications, um, and none of them are, you know. Overall, we said at the Broad Brook Coalition, I don't know if you're going to talk to Bob Zimmerman, so this is second hand. I think the, the water chestnut they're using, I think they're doing that just mechanically. It's on the water itself. Um, but, you know, so that's basically my pitch. That I think they're, you know, I would strongly oppose recommendations to prevent herbicide, but I totally believe in thinking about how do we minimize the uses. Um, I was the one who sort of led the using herbicide at um, Florence Fields, and I personally think it was one of the best decisions that we made because I think if we hadn't done that for two years before kids were using the field, there would have been, um, you know, we couldn't have controlled the weeds. And I think the fact that we used herbicides before kids were there is what's allowed it to be organic for however many years it's, it's been organic, five years, six years. So Japanese knotweed is the biggest culprit in your book in terms of It's the most aggressive. Okay. I mean, bittersweet, actually no, bittersweet is equally yeah. aggressive. Okay. Um, we did hire, we hired Lori Sanders, who's another one of sort of not purest people, to do an assessment of conservation areas. And what we found, I guess it was good news for us, is we found invasives were both worse and better than we thought. At the margins of our conservation areas, it was far worse than we thought and deep and mature forests, it was a lot less. And so it did change. We have, we're actually doing our first timber cut in 30 years, so we don't do a lot of timber cuts. We do it only for stand improvement, not for, for revenue. But we always thought of timber cuts as being one of our tools. And I think what it convinced us is, when I was in college, a 
long time ago. We talked about wanting to do timber cuts in the middle of a forest because you create edge. Lots of animals want to be able to hide in the woods like deer and then wrap the field to eat and run back to the woods. Edge is also where invasives come in. So we don't really want to cut any mature forest besides carbon sequestration, which wasn't the deal when I was in co college. We don't want to do cut, create edge because that's when you get all these invasive plants. So we have a mature forest, we want to do as little as possible. Even our current timber cut is about making the forest more mature so we never need to cut it again. It's so tight to get the nice storms and kill everything. Um, but the edges were a lot worse than we were talking about. And so, uh, and bittersweet is typically the, in the, in the dense forest stands, bittersweet is our biggest enemy. Um, in the fields, along the bike path, along fields, Japanese knotweed is our biggest enemy. Um, Multiflora rose is certainly bad in certain spots. The drumlin, we tried to burn it and pulled it out, has been a challenge. And then, every, again, this is not my field, but every so often someone will tell us. So Lori Sanders called us up a month ago and said she found a, a couple of spots of silk grass. I couldn't even tell what silk grass looks like. Along the bike path, just beginning to colonize Northampton, and we pulled it out by hand because it was 100 square feet. We could pull it out by hand. Um, so our first priority is always those things that haven't yet established in Northampton. So even though they're in smaller areas, those things we want to catch before they become big. You know, we are never going to get rid of Japanese knotweed. You know, how can we fight it back so we have a bike path? But there's going to be little bit. There's other things maybe we can get rid of. No. Wayne, what about wild grape vines in um, forests and woods? Is that not in one of the... It's definitely a problem. It's not as smothering of the forest as bittersweet. So in terms of priorities, no. But yes, it's, it's out there. Um, and, and so using, well, particularly bittersweet, which I know more about, that's the area where we would never spray a healthy bittersweet. We would cut it, and then we would paint the stalk. And that uses very low chemical. We paint the stalk, because otherwise it's going to regress. I went to spot off Pleasant Street yesterday to give a class a tour. There was a piece of bittersweet that's literally a foreign stall. Oh. And I had never realized that. I would just missed that spot. It's not a conservation division property. But that one we're absolutely going to cut, and we're going to paint the stall for that, that piece. Um. So what does Lori recommend for those areas uh, where there's a lar too large of an area to pull it by hand? Well, the, the way we've been treating it, I mean, we've hired her. She has, she has an, well, I'm not sure she does since she's been at Historic Northampton, but she used to have an herbicide license, applicator's license. So the, and we hired her a couple times for it. So the cut what you can, like bittersweet, and then paint the stalk. Um, we did do a test, not totally satisfying, but it was so much labor. So before the goats, the way we, and, and again, you know, our scale is tiny. We're not treating a lot of things. But for um, Japanese knotweed, we would typically cut and then spray the, the stem. We actually bought a hypodermic needle oh. where you can actually do it. And you can imagine the labor is so intense that we just tried it once and it works in theory. It, it, it's very effective. But to shoot every single stalk is just not doable. Now, it could be doable at the community gardens on Birch Pit Road where there's the specific thing and there's a reason to want to be organic or at, at the organic farm off uh, Meadow Street. So that, that's why we, I mean, the reason we're trying to have this selection, you know, this, this set of tools and techniques is some things work almost everywhere. Hypodermic needles are never going to work broad le level, but it and goats might be perfect next to an organic farm. Um, so. Um, and then the other thing we haven't really been successful about is obviously, you, you know, to accept we can do plantings that outcompete, we'd like to do that. It hasn't been great. We did a project with Nature Conservancy on Ella Island, where they're planting, they've done the work of planting elms, Dutch, you know, a, a, a resistant elm tree. And we've been trying to sort of, how can we pull down the bittersweet before it kills it, you know, so the trees get established. And then once it's established, we think it's self-perpetuating. Um, and there are a lot of things that are self-perpetuating, but they're at least the only ones we've seen are mature as forest, and that's an entire lifetime. Can you tell us a little bit more about the trial with the goats? I know you and I have talked yeah. about it, but I think it's useful for this. So I can tell you the trial. I will say, I think what we've concluded so far is it is not reproducible in any commercially viable stage. 
So there used to be Go Girls in Amherst. We looked at hiring them and they rejected us as they didn't want a spot where it was close to people, where goats might get stolen. They didn't want a spot that was on steep slopes. They went out of business. Their model still didn't work for them. They gave the goats to Smith Oak. Smith Oak turned us down for the same sites. Then there's a, a woman who approached us this year who said she has two pet goats and she's interested in expanding and wants to explore this as a business opportunity. And um, she's a writer. And so she has her goats out there and she sits in her computer. She watches them. She's not leaving them, so she's willing to do steep sites, willing to do things with people. And when she's bored writing, she gets up and pulls the Japanese knotweed by hand. <laughs> and so we do the first quarter acre for free. We're doing an that was for Japanese knotweed along the bike path and the steep slope. She's doing another a quarter acre for us for $500 now um, off Linseed Road and some, some land that we'd like to convince the budding farmer to take over. And that's why we don't want to use chemicals. We want the farmer to take it over. It's a great model, and, I, and we're, we're applying to CPA this year for $10,000 to scale up the model a little bit. But I don't think it's a profitable model. You know, $500 for three weeks of the work where you're out there full time is great for someone who's a writer and likes being outdoors, and it's some money. Um, but I don't think it's really a good model. So that, so that bigger model isn't there yet. In the eastern part of the state, we looked at prices a little bit. They were charging about $700 for a quarter acre and they had bigger goats, I mean, uh, bigger herds of goats. Um, you know, the idea of goats, which she's not at, she only has two, is you actually want to overgraze. You want them to, sh to not have any of the choice. So this Japanese not least site work because you wanted everything gone. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't work if you had good things and bad things. Right. And we want them to overgraze to actually cause damage. Um, that's an experience of buffaloes in South Dakota and the experience of goats in Massachusetts. Wait, um, do you know of any municipalities that actually have purchased and owned goats? From I don't, but I haven't done any research. Um, the problem, not surprised, I mean, obviously some of the folk does, but um, the problem is obviously during the winter. I, mean, I think if if we lived in New Zealand, there'd be no problem with goats, but you've got to house them for a lot of the years. Uh, but again, I haven't done any research. Um, do you know room in your office? <laughs> not, not no. And also we have limits with this sort of, this woman's great, but one of the goats are great at is they like poison ivy. Um, but she picks her goats up every day and puts them in her trailer and brings them to her house. So she doesn't want to treat poison ivy sites. She'd have to wrap her goats in Tyvek clothing, literally. And then she takes them out of the Tyvek so that we haven't gotten to that point. Um, and it's not been lack of, I mean, since that experience with Goat Girls, we, you know, we've talked to Smith Oak, you know, is there a site that would work for them? The problem is a lot of the farmers who do that model, Goat Girls, the equivalent eastern part of the state, are great if you have an acre behind the fence where you can leave 10 goats out there for a couple of weeks. And that's the area where the costs will become astronomical. They're not great for the edge along a bike path or the edge along you know, the margin between the Bill River and Grove for the And that's really where we're focusing on is most of those margins. When, when we apply um, uh, herbicides, do we have any kind of a flag or a warning or like they do when they apply chem one on lawns? Don't know the answer. We're, we're, you know, the, the, so the things that a person can do on their own yard, we have to get applicators license for. So I know we follow whatever the laws are, but again, I'm not involved with it. I can, I can check with Tom, our current person. I don't know what we're doing there. Um, we're mostly doing things far away from people. Like one of the reasons we yeah. chose the goat site was it was a spot we didn't want to have to use herbicides because it's right next to where people want to process. Um, and that is part of the story, and I, I come back to this, but this is what I opened with, of you know, we're managing over 15% of the city and my guess is our total application, even including farmers, is less than Ken Wong, where they call themselves now, does True in three acres of land. And you know, from a resource standpoint, I'd rather fair. I know we can't regulate them, but you know, how do we get? You know, I live in Village Hill, and Village Hill Association really doesn't want any chemicals being used, and yet there's lots of Ken Wong signs up there. Yeah, that would be a, uh, the best uh, way to me uh, to reduce those things. Oh boy, yeah, that's funny. So you're, uh, the t this person, Tom, is his dad? Yes, half time. Half time, okay. And um, so, so he would know uh, more of the details of some of the things you might not have the details of. Yes, yeah. He didn't, 
the guy before him, Joe Rogers, is the one who actually bought our current herbicide. So Tom was involved with me. I don't, I don't know why, going back to your question, I don't know why Joe chose this brand of herbicide versus another, mm -hmm. and Tom hasn't gotten to that point yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is Tom's last name? And, and, well, I'm going to mispronounce it. Anise, A-N-N-E-S-E. -E. Mm -hmm. He's half time for us, actually half time for my cell phone. This isn't, wasn't on our list of questions, and we talked about whether we wanted to get into the weeds, no pun intended, um, in asking these kinds of questions. But I'm just curious to start kind of understanding how and where the, the um, chemicals stored. And you know, just, I don't know, I just give us a little bit of background. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a, that's a longer term issue for us. We're actually looking, and we have funding to buy a storage trailer. Um, and we're looking to where we site it. So right now, frankly, the staff person who does it stores in his garage. It's safe in there, and I don't really want it in my office. Um, and so we're we're trying to do that. Wait. So none of this is done in conjunction with the DPW, and you're not using any of their equipment or no. storage space or anything. Like no. That? The only thing we do with that is on the list is. Most people don't think of it as a pesticide, but it is licensed. It is listed as EPA. BTI, which is a soil bacteria, not actually a chemical, we allow to be treated for every wet spot in the city. And that was a 40-year-old conservation, you know, conservation commissions often don't want anything treated. And that was a 40-year-old consensus when the city used to spray adult mosquitoes. Conscom said, you can use BTI on any property we own when we buy land with Mass Audubon, we actually have conditions that we're going to do BTI. In return, we're going to fight any adult spray. Uh, and we, oh, sorry. Um, right. we follow that for you. Uh, can you explain that? I'm, I'm not following you. BTI versus an adult spray, what does that mean? So BTI is a larvicide. It's a larvicide. Um, okay. And it's, it's a larvicide from a naturally occurring bacteria in the soil. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so in theory, everyone will say how safe it is. But, you know, I mean, part of the reason you have this conversation is everyone says everything's safe. And so we don't. We think there's very few non-target species. We think there's no public health risk. But the label will say, "Don't put it in your kids. Don't eat it. Don't let those things." Mm -hmm. And so we just don't take our chance. And so we still treat it as a herbicide, even though it's mm -hmm. a bacteria. Mm -hmm. No, no negative impacts. which doesn't mean it's not. It. And it comes in a donut. You can buy them and stop and shop. You know, uh, Home Depot. Donuts, yes. um, Fred Pirog used to be DPA's person. He knew every wet spot in the city. I don't even know since he's retired who does it. But we've given them blanket approval to spread. Um, and most environmental groups, like Mass Audubon didn't do it themselves, but we, we've now bought about 100 acres of land with them and we reserve the right to do BTI. They never object. So, how did that relate to the so we So, we've given them, it's the only thing they do in our conservation land. Oh, oh, oh. So even though it's conservation land, so it's there for on my list, it's not my staff who's, who's putting that out there. So the DPW sprays the BTI? They're pellets, but yes, they drop the pellets. Oh, they drop the pellets. Yeah. Um, and, and you know that, you probably have heard this, um, Harvard School of Public Health has been monitoring mosquitoes in the state. We've now gotten warmer water mosquitoes. So this has nothing to do with herbicides, but everything to do with how do we reduce these, these things. So um, they're now monitoring. They've now found for the first time a mosquito that can carry Zika. No Zika in Northampton. They've only found like two of these mosquitoes. I'm not trying to alarm people, but the mosquitoes that can carry Zika have now hit in a couple of these traps. The early warning sign for them is tires, because tires get half buried in the environment. Um, and then they have warmer water, so mosquitoes can live through the winter. So part of the answer of reducing herbicides for us is Tires, I, if you ask me five years ago, I'd say they're ugly, we should get rid of them when we have time, but they're actually, you know, sterile. The health hazards. We now consider them a health hazard, and we think getting rid of them reduces the pressure for using adult insecticide. So I think things like that have to be part of the story. How do we manage this? DPW's biggest application of BTI is actually in um, uh, uh, cash bases around the city, because the cash bases are in theory, and, and when Queen cephalitis got out, they started treating they, they like the one. Triple E. Triple E, thank you. They started doing what with this? Dropping BTI, Dropping do a BTI. better job in cash basis. Okay. Um, and then uh, it's the health department that governs the spraying for adult mosquitoes. Is that not true? Mm, I think so. But from public roads, I think they also need permission from the landowner if they want to buy the property. 
So that, that's, the, so that's the, the genesis 40 years ago of saying we're allowed BTI, but we're fine until, et cetera. Now obviously, if Zika came here, everything could change in terms of the rules. Who is Zika? It's that horrible bite that creates uh, swollen cephalitis and babies yeah. and fetal abnormalities. Yeah. Okay. Extreme. It's been around for years and suddenly hit the news for some reason five years ago. I'm not sure why. Wasn't there a bit of a rash of cases down in Florida yeah. or something? So it yeah. well, it was South right. America. It was in South America and there was a rash of cases. Oh, yeah. There's only a few oh, cases yeah. in Florida. Yeah. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a terrible, terrible situation. So okay. do we do any, on your side of the city properties, do we do any spraying for adults? No. Yeah. And do you, we know if the DPW does any spraying for adults? Not as far as I know, but I'm not. Okay. When you said catch basin, are you you're referring to the CSO sites? No, they're, they're just stormwater. They're, they're not CSOs, but they're basically you know, wherever you see a grate in the street, yeah. that's a catch basin. Oh, okay. But it's not it's not sanitary. CSO would involve sanitary sewage as well. Oh. Okay. So they're just stormwater. Um, okay. We don't have any. So hopefully, there's no. Right. The the only CSO the only gotcha. combined or a couple ones we miss every so often we find something, but 30 years ago the city got rid of all the ones they do, and then once in a couple gotcha. of years we find one we miss. So, okay. You know. Uh, the towing place on the Pleasant Street, Harold's, had an illegal connection. So that stuff shows up from time to time. Right. Um, so the conservation land is managed by um, a staff, a half-time staff member in terms of... And lots safety. of volunteer partners. And lots of volunteer partners. And the one parcel of farmland um, where pesticide use is allowed uh, there are really no controls. Whatever the farmer wants to use is the farmer's using, and you don't really track that. Right, right. And we know it's very expensive. We know he's very, when we've met with him, we know he's very thoughtful about it. So, no, we don't track what he's using or the application, mm -hmm. but we do know he's certainly thought about it, and from a cost standpoint, so he's been very careful. So, just to back up around that a little bit, um, the, the CPA funds have been used to control invasives, to, to hire a contracted um, pesticide applicator at Broadway Coalition and a few other locations. And I actually wanted to ask more about those. Um, so the locations have been Broadway Coalition, the Lathrop community, is that right? Which is not conservation area. We have a conservation restriction, which is like an APR. So part of that land, it can never develop. But we don't own it. We don't manage it. Okay. And then there was a third location. Two other ones. So um, off the bike path and leaves, between the bike path and the river, we did some control over there. Um, and then... With um, CPA funds? I don't, uh, don't remember approving that. Um, <laughs> I don't remember. We had money from the bike path extension. Yeah, I used for that. CPA um, well, we had a CPA one that was for doing basic control without being site specific, so it's some flexibility for that. Oh, I see. And then the, the conservation land, Mineral Hills off Chesterfield Road, we did some treatment over there. So um, we hired Lori Sanders for both of those initially, uh, and then we did a follow up, which I think was from CPA, and we did a follow up on the bike path with. It used to be Chris Pollock, and he has a different name for the business. Yeah. Um, we that's what Broadway used to use, to right. or does use. Right. Um, so what was on that playthrough? I don't know what chemical they used, but invasive control. It was, and that, that was CPA money? Yes. And, and I will say, and I tell the story, I've been here 31 years, I've purchased over half the open space in the city. I would say in almost every target metrics we have in terms of restoring things and buying land where it's so much better off than we were 31 years ago but invasives were so much worse off you know it's where we're losing the battle and so even though we're not the volume we have isn't a lot we're going to be stepping up our game in terms of both non you know non-chemical and chemical treatments again the volume is still going to be probably less than a liter a year but um you know the problem is huge there are organic herbicides out there, and I'm blanking on the names of them. There's a couple of them that are very well-known, popular. 
And I'm wondering if you've ever considered any of those. We've looked at them, you know, looked at, and again, I'm not the one who's done the research, so I right. couldn't tell you by name either, but none of them have been satisfying as being really successful in the process. It's, it's that, you know, it's different in your back. I, this is part of the person understand the camel and stuff. It's different in your backyard where you have a few weeds coming up between your asphalt. You know, the volume of land that we manage. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, so none seem like they've been satisfying for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you're expecting that this is going to be a continue to be a bigger and bigger problem? Yeah, I mean, again, our, our top priority is how do we catch? I mean, you know, maybe the biggest argument makes for how do we reduce herbicides? It's to to be more aggressive and catch things early. Mm -hmm. And even I mean, some of that is mechanical, and some of that's goats. They are going to fit part of it. But even when we're using chemicals, I'd rather use chemicals on half acre land and let it go wild. And also, I, I mean, using forestry as an example, because we're in the business of carbon sequestration, business of natural systems, we're not doing commercial timber cuts. And we're only doing it when it's habitat improvement. But, you know, we all have homes made of wood and people are importing wood, and so we do believe in working landscapes. And we will often buy a conservation restriction on private land, and we're fine with people cutting that property, and that's almost, you know, that invites invasives. <coughs> Which is good overall. We, at least we control it better here than someone who's logging somewhere else. But, and I will also say indirectly, there have been a couple times we couldn't afford a piece of land, and the way the seller got their, when I say we do almost no timber cuts, the way the seller got the basis in their land down to what we could afford is they would do a timber cut with our blessing, even though we weren't doing it, and then we would acquire the property. And we'd work with them and say this is the last timber cut ever. But so the one on South of Chesapeake Road is like that. Um, so, so there are other timber cuts that were indirectly involved. Uh, and we are looking at one other um, uh, significant timber cut to restore it's a, a pine barrens that we own. And we're going to do a timber cut there to restore the pine barrens. Mm. Uh, so, so red pine, the ones that, are, that have been kind of felled by that invasive insect? This is the old gravel pit off of right. First Pit Road. Um, and it was traditionally a fire ecology. And fire ecology don't have a lot of young plants growing. And so we're working with natural heritage and still doing an assessment of what do we do to restore that. Um, this one of the been to Montague Plains, this one of the Montague that's sort of a similar type thing. Very controversial uh, timber cut 20 years ago. Now people are happy to restore its function. But it will be the same thing. When we need to cut the timber, we know there could be some invasive challenges. So the last page goes back. I think we've gone over all these things, but the last page is sort of what are all things that we've we've looked at and what are the trade-offs for, for doing all these things. <coughs> Actually, Wayne, as long as you're here, we have a few more minutes. Do we do we have a few more minutes in terms of other well, things on our agenda? We're, uh, we we don't have other things on our agenda. We have taken way more of Wayne's time oh, than, okay. we had, than, than he had bargained for and that we had asked for. Um, but if he's willing to stay and you have another question, go for it. I just so we also have the policies. I just want to thank you. Oh, that's right. Those policies. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, a really quick question for you. Um, could you give this committee a, a really quick overview about how um, pesticide reduction fits into the resilience plan that you're working on right now? Yeah. I mean, so I, I think for us, you know, we want to do as much as we can for carbon sequestration. Um, and I think carbon sequestration is the key. And so if using an inorganic chemical lets us be more successful carbon sequestration, that's a good thing. So that's the, when I talk about the no-till, for example. You know, if we can get, you know, reducing erosion from farmland is a good thing, even if that means using some chemicals. Um, getting mature trees that are less likely to be challenged by bittersweet is a good thing. Um, and so that's that's sort of been that's our, our top goal. But in terms of recommendations in the plan, are there 
actual statements that call for um, examination or goal of pesticide um, use reduction in the city? Um, I don't remember, frankly, because we just sort of we switched it from the consultant who put this together based on public forums, and now we're looking at comments and updating it. There is in the sustainability plan, the eleven-year-old plan for doing it. Yeah. I think this general yes, actually, I do remember this. Yes, the general language, but it's in that context of the broader thing. How to use chemicals in a way that makes soils healthier and stores. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being so generous with your time and information. No problem. I would just, when I email this so it's complete, like, that purple blue stripe thing I remember as I went along, I'm going to amend this just to add the one box, the purple blue stripe. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good to see you. No way, it's not true, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we're learning is that um, uh, we may need more time with each department than we're allotting, but that was very uh, informative. Mm -hmm. um, Except for you saying. He has a list of glyphosate and trichlorpyr here, but he's saying they don't use it? There's, he's saying they use glyphosate, they just don't use the, the product called Roundup. There are many products that have glyphosate in them. They just don't happen to use Roundup. Glyphosate's the active ingredient. Right. So the uh, surfactants that you were referring right. to, these other brands probably have the same Some or similar right. surfactants. I mean, I don't think they're any less harmful. Around well, them. they could very well be. They could less be toxic. They could be. That just but I'll bet you anything we won't know that toxic <laughs> mixture. Yeah. For some mm. reason. Right. Um, yes. So we could find out what brand they're using if that's useful information for you right. and your research. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, okay. Well, I that was very interesting. Um, and concerning. Um, and uh, this is a huge challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing, nothing is simple. I'll second that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> do we want to uh, talk more about that or shall we move on to um, other policies? You have other municipalities' policies. Strong feelings? I, mean, I, I just, I can give a one sentence for the municipal policies. Okay. I, spend a little more time. Um, I think you'll see those are extremes. Andover is a whereas, whereas, whereas chemicals are not so great, you know, and it's sort of a sort of a soft approach. It's the more recent. The gold standard, from what I understand, is the Marblehead one, where they're actually applying fines and enforcement. Whereas Andover isn't really going in that direction. Mm -hmm. So um, in the interest of time, you know, the Marlboro one is still the one that people are holding up. I, I can't imagine how they're enforcing that. But, mm -hmm. And if they are, you know, but it's there and they're both board of health policies. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully we'll get some more. Is Marble had a, it's a ban in private homes too that the health department is? I use it because there's, there's you know, state preemption laws. It's yeah. just for municipal yeah, it's, yeah. it's public education for privately owned land, yeah. but it's um, prohibition for so the fines city. piece of it. Mm -hmm. it's Who would that. they be fining? Oh, that's a good question. Um, have to, um, there's actual language about fining? Yes. Yes. Yeah, there is. Yes. So it's right here. Um, hmm. I've known about it for years and I've never actually read it. Yeah, violations and penalties. Mm -hmm. On town owned land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's for town owned land. So, so who's the fine? Yeah, who would they be fining? It's so strange. Well, if the city has control over how it's managed, it's unlawful for any person to use or apply any time chemical pesticide on any town owned land. So I, I suppose so, I, 
So um, I suppose if a farmer, you know, was renting farmland from the town and yeah. sprayed, that yeah. would be one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another might be a, a city employee who's kind of not aware. <laughs> okay. but those are the only ones I can think of. So Cindy, you know that I sent to Adele this map and a whole bunch of information about um, municipalities all across the United States that have, so there we have really rich material to dig into for sure. You said that was on. Did I you sent put it, it on the whitelet, right? The map I did, but there's, there's um, also a Google Doc that Beyond Pesticides has created. Oh, maybe it's the same thing, actually. I, I, didn't, that. I didn't get a separate thing. I, I got the map, which has things you can click on. Yeah, I think that's the um, Google Doc, too. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's a, yeah. But I'll, I, I mean, you can share this with me, too. But um, yeah. there was just more information that the okay. pesticides had. Yeah. yeah. So we can, why don't we just send it to everybody on the committee? That's it's OK yeah. to send out information. Yes. And then, but in addition, you put it on the wake right? Yes. OK. That so that's what makes it available. Document. Um, does the public have access to our wakelet? I didn't make it public for now. Yeah, okay. Um, interesting question. Um, I, guess, I guess what sort of concerns me or makes me feel embarrassed is, and I don't know how widespread this is, but um, Adele, I know you mentioned you came to the Board of Health a few years ago mm -hmm. and tried to make this pitch. Mm -hmm. The Board of Health wasn't in a place where they wanted to go in that direction because mm -hmm. they had so many other things that they were working on. Um, but, you know, if we find that it's some standard or practice in, in the Commonwealth that the Boards of Health are taking this on versus the City Council, I think that's something we should always keep in the back of our mind because the Board of Health can do that. Whether the, And it would be interesting to get Meredith's Meredith's take on that um, when she comes before us because uh, um, mm -hmm. I think it sits in the right place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the recommendations can be where the hell takes it off. <laughs> so I'm just saying that because I think it's good that this committee is here and the Board of Health is going to have to deal with it mm -hmm. um, in a more um, responsible <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's very good for us to keep in mind. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so it's something for us all to keep in the back of our minds as something that we might, in fact, recommend. It would be interesting. It will, it will be very interesting to talk with Meredith. Because, yeah, as we've talked before, the Board of Health has that authority mm -hmm. more than city council. If we can say this is harmful to the public's health. Just to note, though, that we don't have jurisdiction as a city council committee over the Board of Health. So, right. of course, it's a recommendation we can make. Right. But right. Mm -hmm. the city yeah. council could pass policy that you know sets this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the tension yeah. there. Mm -hmm. But it's true that a lot, I think a lot of this, the municipalities um, once we dig into those policies from other places, it's their board of health that mm -hmm. have um, been the, pl the main players and shifting things for sure. I mean, that's why, I mean, for language, I, I have no problem looking at Tulsa, Oklahoma's policy, if they have one, I don't even know, but, but we're so unique in the Commonwealth that th those are the kind of policies that I think are going to be so relevant. So maybe for our next meeting, why don't we make it a goal to um, provide some samples of municipalities that have policies that are not from the Board of Health, just so that we can in the compare. Health? In yes, in the company. Mm -hmm. to find some one municipalities that have yeah, non Board of Health policies. The important thing to remember too, in looking at other states, is that they don't all have state preemption around pesticide use. So. Some places have actually even um, mandated that private property has to be managed in particular ways, whereas we in the Commonwealth don't have that opportunity. So just when we're looking at policies, we have to keep that piece in mind, which states have state preemption, which don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's in your way, Clint. 
Yeah, so that's um, that's why I'm hoping we can focus on Massachusetts municipalities policies. Because then we're, we're start out there. We're, we're within our own context. It is now noon. Um, does anybody have any anything else quick, quickly that we should address before we adjourn? I have just one thing I want to say about Wayne's remarks. I found it interesting, um, two things. First, that identifying the problem earlier, you know, like, oh, but there was that silk grass, I think it was, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that then you can make, you know, you could go in and you just pull it by hand. Mm -hmm. So that um, just being more aware of where the invasives are, yeah. you avoids any pesticide it, and further expenses down the road. The other thing is that the the geometry, <laughs> that how it has to do with the where the invasives are problem, problematic. It, that we're not talking a big field of you know it's the edges. It was in the triangle. It's along the bike path. That the, the the boundaries and the um, and, and the places where two different environments are meeting up are where the problems are. Right. And we go from river to floodplain to hills to forests. We have farmlands all over. So we're going to have edges all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that probably really complicates things. Mm -hmm. So um, right. it's kind of, we're, we're probably a model for, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> for the perfect place for invasives. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because like the meadows, the boundary lines out there, if you pull it up on the map, there's a lot of them that are straight, but there's all of these strange edges and triangles and, you know, yeah. right. all the, the, the old world way of um, declaring your property. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all out there. Yeah. And then we have all these rivers winding their way, like the Mill River has always... Yeah. So we end up with this yeah. crazy yeah. main curving main street, mm -hmm. right. thanks to the Mill River. Right. Just because she was mentioned, should we invite Lori I was just going to say the same thing. I agree. Because she, she provides this unique perspective. She does. I agree. And, um, I, don't know how to about that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And with which organization is she associated? She right now is co director of the, the Northampton Historical Society. Oh, okay. Or, but it's a she's, um, she's a biologist, conchologist. Mm -hmm. She's a wildlife biologist. Yeah. Yeah. And she does and tours she's around the city and mm -hmm. remote parts of the city. And has a very interesting thing. Um, and Wayne mentioned Mass Audubon. Mm -hmm. I was wondering mm -hmm. if you want to consider. Does anyone have a contact there? I can I find do, you, but it's this guy Tom who works for the city yeah. too, and I think that would be too complicated in terms of his two hats. Right. Um, okay. Well, I'll, I, I can also inquire. I know other people who deal with them more. Does anyone else have a suggestion for Mass Audubon contact? Mm -hmm. I just know that they manage a lot of property down that way. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll. Add that to my list of things to do. Okay. Move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I second. Third. <laughs> I think we have four already. So <laughs> all, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, we're adjourning.